engineer and designer, and I'm one of the founders of Edge Riders. Um, it's an online community that lives in, on its own um, platform. It's based on discourse, and we develop our own tools to try to make sense of our conversations and try to collaborate. Um, and the key term here being collective intelligence. This is a question. How do we turn our interactions and our conversations into knowledge that's bigger than the sum of its parts? Um, the reason why I'm obsessed with this is that um, not so long ago, my family uh, had to escape the Gulf War um, and rebuild our lives in Stockholm. Um, and this was uh, during what later came to be known as a decade of violent racism. Um, because of the war in the Balkans, you had an um, unexpectedly large number of people coming in from former Yugoslavia, and this coincided with the worst recession um, in, in, a, in 60 years. And as you can imagine, this was a recipe for disaster. Um, it didn't take long for things to turn ugly. Um, and I, I just want to... Uh, no? Okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> this, is a, this is a video from a, a TV show. You have Susanna Evans, who's a representative for UKIP, which I think needs no further introduction, and it's Varoufakis. And um, th there's a, uh, uh, an audience, and a, a member of the audience asks, so should we take in more refugees, uh, considering that our housing system doesn't really work and our healthcare can't cope? Um, and this really got me thinking, really, it was really, really interesting. Um, why are there these reactions? I don't know, but there's a hint, and the hint is in this question. The fear that we will not be cared for, that every new person into the system is one that will be kicked out, uh, that will fall through the cracks, and that person could be us. And so, it would be easy to say, oh, but we can fix it with this or that magic solution. Oh, let's increase taxes, let's do this. Tech is gonna answer all the problems. Let's just make apps or open source this or that. The thing is, it's a little bit more complex. As soon as you're <laughs> trying to solve problems in complex adaptive systems, it's like shifty sands, right? And you try to do something here, and then it's connected to something else there, and then the conditions change, so it's, it, it's quite difficult. It's, it's bigger than any one person's can, brain can even process, just the sheer volume of information. So what do we do? So this is La Scuola di Atene. This is a, a painting. Um, Raffaele painted it 500 years ago as a tribute to wisdom and courage of humans seeking truth. And over here you see the top 40 chart of Greek philosophers. Um, so you have Pythagoras on the left, uh, is uh, on the front left, um, and you see him studying this large tomb, and you have Epicurus, you have Socrates, Heraclitus, and in the center of the action, you have Plato and Aristotle. Um, they're in deep discussion as they're, as they're walking towards us. And this makes sense because discussion or dialogue, like Plato called it, is what powers their knowledge. And if you look around, debate is everywhere, discussion is everywhere. And 25 centuries after Plato and five after Raphael, this is still how science works, more or less. The thing with dialogue is that it's not just about collecting information. It's a process that changes the information. It, it, aggr it, it augments it by putting it in a richer context. And a, a well-run debate can feel like walking into a room with a piece of a map. Uh, and, and then you find others who have other pieces of the map. And through a good conversation or exchange, you, you feel like you have the whole map. The whole is more than the sum of the parts. And it never ends, because questions beget answers, 
that lead to more questions, that lead to more answers, and more questions, and never, it's like a living thing. And it's kind of like um, life, like genetic information. It's continuously traded between organisms and gives rise to new life. And so this is why edge riders exist. Um, edge riders encourages truth-seeking, result-oriented conversation as a knowledge engine. Um, nobody is smarter than everyone, and the intelligence is in the interaction between the individuals. The problem is that um, conversations don't scale really well. I mean, you, you, you can get to, uh, you know, a hundred people can't really have a, a good conversation. They can't all keep the same perspective somehow and keep in mind what's been discussed, who said what, and have it coherent. And you can have a lot of uh, insights generated and validated, but that only happens locally. Um, and so how can you tell which understanding, which insights are solid, which ones are a product of just part of this bigger conversation? Um, and more importantly, how do you actually use them to tackle some of these big, messy problems? So the answer is community. So EdWriters is an online community of people from all over the world, around 80 countries, hackers, artists, doctors, high school dropouts, people who work in the state, people who uh, are afraid of the state. <laughs> it's quite a mix. Uh, and what people have in common is that everyone is trying to tackle um, some kind of challenging problem um, in service of the public good. And a lot of these problems are, and, and what they're trying to do are quite far outside the mainstream. And they're doing these difficult things and it's a, it's a community of mutual support. So on this online platform, people share experiences from trying to do these different things. And it's not like startup braggy, like this is how I'm amazing and my solution is gonna solve the world. It's an honest conversation where we say, okay, this is what I'm trying to do, this is how it's going, this is what's working, this is what's not working. Um, and this has the advantage that, one, it gives us access to valuable information from different domains. It um, makes it possible for people to connect us with relevant information or support. It also means that we avoid, help each other avoid mis expensive mistakes or replicating the work that has already been done. Basically, it, it helps us to build on each other's work rather than replicating or competing with it. So how, how do we tackle, how, how do we use this co community conversation or collective intelligence engine to tackle complex problems? Well, we do it in, in four parts. So we pick a hard problem, uh, we find people who are working on parts of the problem, we build a sense of shared a, a fate somehow, a shared, like a sense of community of being connected and we seed collaboration. Uh, and then we find ways of enabling people to work together. Collaboration often doesn't happen because it's hard. Uh, because it requires resources and time and energy. So we look at how can we make space available for us uh, creatively. So if we take, uh, let's take an, the issue I was pointing to, which was zero-sum thinking in the welfare state as, uh, as fanning the flames of, of racism and our, our worst impulses. Well, the pink elephant in the room is that some of this fear is justified because the cost of healthcare is growing much faster than GDP and at some point we're going to be using all of our production just to stay alive, which is clearly unsustainable. Um, so the, the good news is that we, we know that people are experimenting with, with parts of a solution to tackle this, um, and so we reach out to some of those people. So this is uh, from a, hack, a biohacking space in Oakland, and it's tackling the problem of drugs. So Anthony and a couple of others, Anthony has diabetes, and he's quite upset about the fact that um, it's, 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 
if affordable in insulin is really hard to access. Uh, even in Europe and in, in, in welfare states where we have free at the point of delivery health provision, it's not like it's free, it's still super expensive, it's just we don't feel it immediately. And for poorer communities or in countries that are um, still not doing so well economically, it, there's no way of getting a hold of a tr tr treatment for for this disease, for diabetes, and this leads to serious in illnesses like blindness or amputation, coma or even death. And there's no generic insulin on the market and prices are kept artificially high by patent strategies of a few companies that control it. So even if it's out of patent, the uh, pharmaceutical companies will find new patented ways of administering it. So it's, um, it's and, and, and this is the case with a lot of medication like Daraprim, AIDS medication, some asshole <laughs> buys the company that produces it and the prices go up, I think, with 700%. Life-critical drugs. Um, so, Anthony and a bunch of others in the community are trying to change this by open sourcing the knowledge to produce insulin. So, we ask Anthony and others working on these solutions, to share their experiences online, right? And if you think about the fact that at this point we're almost 4,000 people, lots of conversation, lots of projects. So how do we make sense of it? The first move is to treat it like ethnography, uh, online ethnography. So ethnography is a qualitative research method that results in a description of a group that encodes the perspective of the group in question. It's, it's not like somebody looking from the outside in and then telling you who you are. Rather, it's how the group understands itself seen from its own perspective. Um, and the thing about ethnography is that you can work with no hypothesis to prove. You can just be looking at a question or a field without even knowing which direction to look into. Um, you just let the participants take the study in whatever direction they think makes sense. So, what we do is, we treat our conversations on the online platform as ethnographic data. We, um, we quote it, and we tag it, and what happens is that we can then start to find hidden connections. We can start to find connections between seemingly unrelated topics. And we can also start to see where people have shared interest or are, are working on topics that are related or techniques or whatever. Um, and so the, our, we develop these tools for ourselves and we, we Im put them in, on the platform directly so members can also use this. Um, and then, We also developed software to, um, like network analysis set software. So we can represent the discussion as a network where the nodes, they represent people, and the arcs represent interactions, basically comments. Um, and so at this point, we, we, we can uh, denote our conversation as a graph, and graphs you can, you can understand mathematically. Um, and in general, these maps, they can help us to um, assign credibility or, or how valid a certain statement or conclusion is in the community. Is it, is it something that's just happening in a corner somewhere or is it a statement or a, a, a conversation which is resonating with a lot of people? Um, so here, for example, is a conversation, an older conversation, the blue, right? And then a new topic is introduced in the community. And you can start to see that you can have big conversations, these are hundreds of, of participants, that still maintain coherence. And you can also start to see that um, 
even though it's a large conversation, you have sub-conversations, and you see that they're connected by individuals. So you can have new topics all the time, and, but there's still this connection with the older repository of knowledge and people and, and know-how. So the third thing that we do is we, we pull together this ethnographic data and the social network data to uh, build semantic social networks. Um, And, you know, the math is still, it's still not really there. But for us, we, we can see that the method is already useful. So the, the conversation around um, health uh, and, and social care solutions like op the, the, the Open Insulin Project. So it's a, it, it's a kind of solution mapping exercise. So. Um, after a, a deep conversation, you start to get a, a really dense graph, but we can also then filter away some of the pieces and we can start to make it more legible. And the graph is, uh, it's, it's quite powerful because it, it, it gives us a list of what the conversation, what the conversation itself thinks are the most important elements of the care, like of, of the community tackling care problems. And it also gives us how the conversation think that these different elements are connected with each other. It's not what one person thinks, it's what the conversation thinks in one image. And it starts to show us a way into tackling a big challenge without needing to know in which direction to go, we can start to see how we can, how we can start to navigate it. And so, some, you know, the, the, this is the gist of it, really. So you need to convene smart communities around a problem, and then you need tools to induce a, a collectively intelligence response to making sense for also finding the others with whom you could collaborate and build things. Um, and so, back to collaboration, like why doesn't it happen? You know, we've been doing this for six years and we've been doing workshops and having these conversations and everybody wants collaboration, everybody knows we need collaboration. And yet it doesn't happen nearly enough. I mean, the internet, I mean, how many mm, GitHub repositories are there with s software that nobody's using? Or, uh, you know, the, the internet is a graveyard of all kinds of tech that nobody really, that was promising. And people put a lot of initiative into and time, but they, but they never really went anywhere. Um, part of it has to do with, I would argue, having a shared understanding of reality. So if you take the healthcare or the racism issue again, when it's complex, people, people, have, people are looking at it from different perspectives. You know, like a tree. A tree looks really different if you're staring at the bark this close or if you're far away or if you're looking at the leaf or up or from a distance. So if you don't have a shared understanding, of the reality in which the problem exists, it's very difficult to have uh, an intelligent conversation or a meaningful conversation. Um, another part is that it's hard to find, you know, people like projects. People like to be founders of projects and drive their projects. I'm sure <laughs> I see some people smiling, yeah, right? Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to get people to, s even if you see the value of collaboration, the feeling of like abandoning your baby. It's such a, it's so counterintuitive. So working like this helps us to start to see connections between different projects. And we can start to look at how we can work in alignment rather than trying to get everybody to work on the same project. And where there's alignment, we can start to think about pooling resources and where there's pooling of resources, we can start to think about community and shared effort, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we found that it actually worked. I mean, this is, this is coming out of the community just the past two years. 
not even, it's like a fraction. So um, the open insulin crowd, they were in Oakland and through the community, they met someone else who's running a biohacking lab in Ghent, but this biohacking lab is actually about teaching children um, a new met met methodology for teaching STEM to children. Um, and he'd heard about this project and thought it was super cool, but didn't necessarily have an entry point. But because Anthony shared his own experience on the platform, it was like an opening, saying, hey, I'm here. So they started to interact. Winnie realizes, we need, actually, we need some projects to put some of this talent at. We don't have enough projects. Anthony has a, a project and saying the big problem for them is they need enough brains looking in this direction. More brains that are looking in this direction, it'll progress faster. Then Winnie goes to the States and he meets Thomas uh, from Cameroon. And Thomas is, uh, is, a, is a, an open source or free software. I'm not sure what the ontological distinction is in that conversation. Um, he wants to open an open source university in his country, in Cameroon. And this conversation moves onto the platform and then somebody points out that, yo, you're a, you're a biochemist. Why don't you just you know, start by setting up open insulin where you are? And now there's this project that's scaled from being something run by a small biohacking collective in the US to something that's happening in a lot of different places and people are collaborating and fundraising to uh, get equipment to uh, Cameroon. And this happens in less than a year, right? And this is not a project, this is not a project that's happening in a university lab. That's the other thing. It's not in academia, right? Um, so, so many stories, I can't, even, I can't even keep track of them. And so if we, uh, if we go back to the big question of care, social and health care, what does this conversation tell us? What did we learn from all of these experiences of all of these great people and, and projects and, and people who don't have projects but are just trying to do things and trying to figure out how to improve things in their community? Well, some deep insights. Um, you know, it seems quite obvious that technology is not a cure-all for, for health and social care problems, but it's a completely different thing when you have the data, right? And you've had the layer of analysis, and that's a shared analysis. It's partip participatory, collaborative. Even your, you know, the worst techno-determinist who's like got an app for everything, it's very hard to contest this when you've been part of the conversation. You actually know the methodology, you know who the people are, and you know that they're as smart as you, <laughs> if not smarter and very knowledgeable. And this starts to become a way of looking forward and beyond your own project and ego and incentives. Um, we've also learned that care comes from communities. This is the other interesting thing, even the like, the promising technology-based solutions, whether it's hardware, software, or wetware, they all need community. They're all community-driven. Um, and even when people talk about autonomy and the need to have control over your own healthcare solutions or whatever, it's this funny, it's autonomy and community somehow exist hand in hand. You need community to be able to have autonomy and the other way around. Um, and we've also found that we need a third way between state and the market because both of them are, are dysfunctional. So with, with the state, you have a push towards efficiency but also accountability. So, the, you know, like in care, it's super interesting. So, healthcare is one of the areas where costs don't go down as the cost of technology goes down. It actually goes up, which is like, why? Well, one of the reasons is because with more technology, there are, you know, and humans, there are points of failure. 
So you collect all of this data for the bean counters and for accountability. Then there's more um, space for screw ups with somebody not um, taking security seriously. And then there are more routines. And then you end up with a situation where a doctor has to fill in up to 10 databases just to prescribe aspirin. And then you get people, you know, I've, I've heard of cases where you have doctors hiring nurses just, you know, and one of their tasks is moving the mouse around on the different software, so they're not logged out of the 10 different databases that they have to fill in. You know, and the other thing is that it doesn't mesh well with management culture, right? So management culture, you know, information only moves really in, in two directions, up and down. Whereas these kinds of community-driven solutions are adaptive and flexible, they rely on us being in a completely different set of feedback loops with each other, where things move very quickly. I mean, there are so many different reasons as to why, you know, um, the interface with, with the state and those kinds of institutions doesn't work well. But on the other hand, you have the market, which, well, <laughs> pharmaceuticals, et cetera, et cetera, the drive there is to try to make things more efficient. And how do you make things more efficient in care? Well, you uh, minimize the need for humans, right? So how do you minimize the need for humans? Well, technology. So you have your watch talking to your fridge or your pacemaker talking to someone somewhere else and you're not sure where that is and you can't find the code that's broken because, and so on and so forth. And so, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, but we're starting to see a third space in between those two. But, this means that we have to be thinking like ecosystems engineers and infrastructure builders. There's a reason why these solutions don't have a space in our society, so we need to think further. So, this is what we're prototyping now and have been, have been testing for quite a while. One of the challenges with um, projects that are committed to the, to the common good is that a lot of the times the market cannot, the market does not recognize their value. It cannot recognize their value. Example being coordination costs. So, we know that for a lot of these initiatives to scale or do well, it requires a lot of coordination, getting different groups to talk to each other. And that's a cost that nobody wants to carry and that's invisible. And um, the other thing is that some of these projects follow a completely different logic. They're, they're meant to deal with the problems that are generated by the market in the first place. So it's like, hey, take down the master's house with the master's tools and pay me for doing it, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. So, at the same time, people have to live, right? They have to be well. We have to have our, our basic material needs met. We have to have good lives. We, we have to be seen as people, as, as valuable people in the eyes of others, and we have to be able to see a future somehow. So, um, what we're prototyping now is infrastructure, that stands on three legs. So, the first one is this online platform mm, that I mentioned with these collective intelligence tools and the communication culture that means that you have someone who can be super conservative collaborating with someone who's basically, you know, burned property, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, with basically no flame wars. Like, we've been doing this for five years and we've only had one polemic discussion. Right, um, And you have to have a cu culture of openness and, and great community management and so on. So you have an online platform, great. The other part of the, the infrastructure is houses where people can live and work together. So one of the things we found was um, really important for collaboration is that people have to trust each other. They have to like each other. And this evolves at the rate of human relationships. We need to understand each other. And after working together for five years, we started moving in together in houses and becoming family. And this also keeps our costs of living and working low. 
And um, it's just a better life and fun, like living together with all these crazy people. It, it's completely transformed my life, like I would never go back. And the other part is a festival. So uh, a festival that showcases and celebrates the achievements of people doing this work that is so hard and can be heartbreaking and can be exhausting and badly understood. And one, it raises the profile. Two, it, it puts up like a signpost for more of the other children to find their way in, to find their people. And it also uh, spreads understanding. It builds, it builds legibility for what, what people are doing and support. Um, now, the houses are, you know, we live and work together, but we're prototyping a thing now where we set up a kind of academy. So, a lot of people have projects that they have a hard time financing because, yeah, for the reasons I explained. But you need people to work on these projects. And at the same time, you have, I think, like in the Middle East and the North Africa region alone, you have something like 2.6 million people entering the labor market every year on top of the people who are there. And unemployment rates are something like 40% in some parts of the region. And states have been pushing startupism as the solution to everything. Like everybody, be an entrepreneur, you know. Uh, set up a startup and you have accelerators and incubators and all of this stuff. It doesn't work. Of course it doesn't work. I mean, how many Google, like Google, how many employees does Google have? What, like 50,000? And how many Googles can we actually have in a market? One. So do the math. It's never going to work. So there's a need there for people to develop other skills and to be building for a good future together that doesn't rely on a functioning labor market because if you look at the geopolitical stability, all of this stuff, it's not getting better. And it's not just there. It's, if, if you look at Europe, some places that have great economies have had structural unemployment with young people for over 10 years. So it's not, it's not necessarily going to get better. Um, and so what we do is, <laughs> I totally lost my thread of thought, what we do is, we set up a kind of academy, right? So where people who have projects are living in the house and they have to be free or open source. And people who want to develop new skills, they come in and work on those projects. And they learn by working on these projects and they get mentorship and, and moral support from their older, more experienced peers. Everybody gets trained in community building and community management. And what ends up happening is that you maybe get a critical mass of people who have aligned ethics, who know and understand and trust each other, who've learned to uh, work in interoperable ways, and da 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 da. And so, the, the, we, you know, we just did this post something like four months ago. Um, about what we call the open village. That thing that looks like a megaphone, the whole thing, that's what the open village is. So this talk is supposed to be about the road to the open village. That's how we ended up there. So we just put up a post with the idea. And four months later, it's somebody setting one up in Nepal, like a house. A bunch of kids in Egypt are looking for a place to set one up. We just signed the lease for a place in Morocco so on. It's, it's catching on. And the way we set it up is that you don't even need to have a, an, a fully functioning and autonomous space. It's just, it can just be like a plug-in to the hacker space you're already running or the building where you're living. It uses excess capacity. Maybe you, you have some extra desk space that you're not using or a room in your house that you can host someone in. And it's, it, seems kind of, it seems kind of ambitious. Actually, this is what I was going to show. So I did the, n the numbers. <laughs> uh, 
about this. So the yellow one is the mentors. So it would be people who are running specific projects, right? And the white one is the number of houses that you would need. So a number of participants wouldn't scale at the same, the, num the cost wouldn't scale at the same rate as the number of participants. Because if you have every project leader mentoring five other people who graduate from this academy, who build their own projects and in turn mentor other people and mentor other people, it can grow quite quickly. Uh, and if you do it in a decentralized way where you don't need to own anything, then you know the incentives are aligned for people to just run with it. And this is this is what's happened in the past. And so people say, "Oh, you're you're crazy. It's never going to work." Um, well, we've prototyped all the pieces, and it works. You know, we just went ahead. We didn't make much noise about it. So the software's built, the platform's working and up and running and super active. People are using it to do their open and citizen science projects. And we actually just leased the house and started moving in together without talking about it. And it works. And it's so simple. I don't understand why everybody doesn't do it. Um, Kathleen, who's going to do a, a, another talk. She's going to be talking about Unmonastery, which was the... F oh, she's not here. Ah, yeah. So the first edition, <laughs> the first edition of this house um, that came out of this conversation was, oh, let's build a secular monastic order. Um, because that infrastructure has been around in Europe for over 10 centuries. So it's fairly resilient. And it was committed to the common good ish, you know, there was God and then there was <laughs> all of that. That's why we called it the unmonastery because people are like, oh, I don't like God and oh, I want to have sex and all of these things. So we called it unmonastery, but we kept this, the, the, the idea, the metaphor that you live together and you are committed to something bigger than yourself and you have a set of protocols that harmonize um, work and, and life between people so, so we can be well together for long periods of time. And this idea kicked off. It captured the, the public imagination. I think there were like serious design flaws. Um, and I was involved in making those design flaws. And I can tell you many, many things about the many, many ways in which we fucked up and which you should not. This is not how you do it. But we learn from this and it's, you know, you, you're, you're very welcome to join. Like this, this is, it's hard, but it's crazy fun. And with some partnerships and with some mutual support, I don't know, you know. It might work, it might not work, I think it will. But even if it doesn't, it's a lot of fun and you learn a lot of things. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you very much, Nadia. And, um, uh, and apologize for the foul language. Um, I think we have some sense. Um, but uh, if uh, uh, the floor is open right now for questions, uh, um, thank you. I like this uh, monastery metaphor because it's uh, on the one hand it's very social. You have social stuff around the meals and uh, all working together and supporting each other. But at the same time, you have you have your private cell, and you can be alone and work on your own development or whatever in privacy. You know, the traditional collective model uh, of the hippies has a lot of drama and people on top of each other all the time. And uh, so, yeah, <laughs> that was just a general comment. Well, that's one of the things that we didn't do right. <laughs> so, can you say more about that? Yeah, we had. W collective sleeping as well, but this was a practical thing. So we had a couple of months to try this out. Like we got the city of Matera, which is incidentally one of the oldest inhabited human settlements. It's been inhabited for over 9,000 years uh, without interruption. So we got them to give us the building to run the prototype. And there wasn't that much space and everything wasn't perfect, but we always just say, okay, let's do it. Let's just do it and we'll figure it out. So. <laughs> The sleeping arrangements were that there was a big hall with lots of beds on pallets. And um, yeah, that didn't really work very well. So 
mm, you know, it evolved into, okay, let's put the snores in a room. <laughs> and then there was a lot of in-group, there was a lot of conflicts and, and, and griping. Um, part of it, I think, like if I were to do it again, uh, which we are, I would make sure that everyone who came into the house has been part of the online community for long enough and has contributed and understands the culture and the ethics with which we do things. For example, we're not a democracy. We're not a democracy, you know. There's, it's very clear who makes the decisions and it has to be clear who makes decisions because otherwise you end up with these like circular arguments. It has to be, when things go wrong, people want someone to be responsible and to take responsibility. No, they're not elected. It's like it's whoever steps up. You care about something, do it. You know, then it gets done. Don't tell me how to do it or anybody else, unless you're actually putting skin in the game, your own time or resources or whatever. Um, the other part is that making people go through this online process also creates a respect for truth and evidence-based discussion. Nobody cares about your opinions. It's just an anecdote. Even your experience, your individual experience is just an anecdote. Having the tools to be able to see things from a bigger perspective also diffuses a lot of potential conflicts. You're like, Pfft. yeah. Any more questions? Or have I been like amazingly clear? <laughs> Which never happens. Oh, there's one up there. Yeah. Yeah, it should take. Come talk to me afterwards if you want to know more about this. Uh, I want to hear about your work as well and what you're doing. Um, I'm kind of wondering what thoughts the group of people have made about the uh, generational sustainability of such a model, as in uh, kids being born and uh, raised within such monasteries or uh, villages. Whether the very um, end up in opposition to their parents or not? Um, so as you saw on the map, it's different groups are setting up their own spaces. And it, the, what's, what's central and what's shared is things that make the spaces interoperable. But the spaces are not the same. So like in Egypt and Morocco, they have to have sleeping quarters for males and females that are completely separated. Um, some groups have kids, some people don't, some groups are, some people without kids are cool with having them. Actually, one of our directors, uh, John Cote, like if you know your internet history, you know about the well, right? Okay, so John was one of, was like employee number two at the well, and also lived for a really long time at a hippie commun commune called The Farm that's still existing. So that's over 40 years, I would say like the first online community manager. And that's a wealth of experience that we have within the setting. Important thing, I think, again, it comes down to data-driven, evidence-based, methodological approach towards figuring out what to do. And once that's there, you don't have to have, everybody doesn't have to agree, it's okay. So, maybe. Maybe, maybe there could be like intergenerational problems. Like I see baby boomers as the root of much of evil. <laughs> Shut the barrier, <laughs> as we say in Swedish. But I mean, I work with baby boomers and I live with, you know, the, yeah. I don't know. It doesn't feel like a I mean, we'll figure it out, you know. <laughs> the important thing is that you don't think you have the answers to everything. That's the big danger. If you if you think you have if you even think you have the questions, let's start there. How do you know you're looking in the right direction? I don't know. Avoid becoming a cult. No, I I'm saying methodology, methodology, methodology. If if you design your methodology to be an insurance against your own cognitive biases, your psychosocial problems or whatever. 
Like as a, a shared methodology, this is something people can agree on somehow, if it's sound methodology, I think, and evidence, like Plato and Aristotle and Pythagoras, search for truth. <laughs> What? And fascism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's, a, that's a, you know, one of the advantages of being a diverse community. Like, actually, at th this summer, I ended up having like a super bizarre conversation with somebody at Shaw, who uh, was basically a race biologist and, you know, had all of this you know, but it just, and, and was like insisting that certain populations are, it's proven that they're less intelligent than the others, and it's just like, yeah, yeah, chapeau. But show me the data, or fuck off. So. <laughs> okay, that's it. Yeah, um, thank you, Nadia. Do you have any, any more questions? Um? Are there any more questions? Uh? One more? Yeah, next minute. Yeah, I would like to ask, uh, are you linking with uh, other existing communities like, uh, well, just I'm thinking for instance, because if I'm not mistaken, Edge Riders is, has a strong basis in Italy. So for instance, uh, you have this community near Torino, which is called Damanhur, which has a very long uh, history. Yeah. And are, are you linking with, uh, with these? And, and a lot of, uh, actually a lot in Italy, a lot of uh, community working in, for instance, social, uh, so-called social uh, centers. Gentry Sociali, uh, are, are you doing work with them? Um, so here's the interesting thing. I've, what I forgot to say is that, so becoming a part of the community is basically you need an email address and people kind of float, it's like a cloud. People f zoom in and out when something interesting pops in. And a lot of the people who come in are also parts of other communities. So we did this experiment where we did like a, a Twitter, a swarm, uh, what do you call it? Like a flash mob on Twitter. And we ran uh, network analysis on it. And we could see overlap with a lot of other communities that are out there, like um, WeShare or uh, Tamera Collective, or people have multiple. Yeah. So again, it's the links. The individuals are the links somehow. Right. Thank you for me. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Um, yeah, that's good. Right, our next session will begin normal. Uh